click on that, type in your question. And then once we get to the end of the presentation, about 45 minutes, we'll go down the list and take them chronologically. And then if you can see on our first slide here, if you stick around at the end, we are picking two winners for the 50 and $100, <clears throat> excuse me, $100 gift cards that we're going to give away. We will email those out. So we got to stay till the end for that. And then we have a PDF of the presentation that's going to be sent out tomorrow or Friday so that you can have notes and take those. And then we also have this being streamed on our YouTube live channel. So if there's any questions from YouTube, we're going to have to grab those and, and put them in Zoho. So we'll get to the end, wherever, whichever platform you're on. And other than that, uh, I think we're ready to begin. So lo and behold, STEAM fundamentals. This presentation is similar to our last hydronics presentation in that it's for beginners mainly, uh, especially if you're in the maintenance field and it's just relating to STEAM this time. So if you're joining us and you happen to you know, watch the last webinar, really appreciate you attending this. This one's gonna be focused on STEAM. It is working on the ground up and understanding things rather than looking at just a steam trap or a boiler. You're looking at everything from a system, from a high level view so you understand how everything works together. And then hopefully it allows you to get a better picture. And if there's any issues you continually run into that this should help uh, your base knowledge. Uh, so if there's any questions, just type them in. We'll get to them at the end. All right. So to begin, I'm on the left there. My name is Marshall Powers. I've been with State Supply for about a year and a half. I'm a mechanical engineer. Cole and I both went to uh, Minnesota State University, Mankato, and we were both we're both mechanical engineers. Uh, prior to State Supply, I worked for Twin City Fan. They make large uh, commercial and industrial fans. So the fans are kind of similar to pumps. Uh, not that we're covering a lot of pumps today, but I had some relevant experience in the past. Prior to that, I worked as a design engineer packaging medical devices. Cole? And I'm Cole Angel. Like Marshall said, I graduated last year from Minnesota State University Mankato with a mechanical engineering degree. I have been at State Supply for the year since, and I've been working with Marshall on creating trainings and uh, for internal and external use and learning about a lot about hydronics and steam systems. And then we have Marcus here. Do you want to just introduce yourself? Sure. Quickly? Hello, I'm Marcus Tupi, and I, years ago, attended college for fluid hydronics in, uh, in Maplewood, Minnesota, and I am a boiler licensed, a licensed boiler operator, and I've worked in this industry for 35 years, so I've got a few little stories and a few little tips and some information for you if you need it. So hopefully we can help you out. Thanks, Marcus. Awesome. Okay, I'm just gonna go over a little overview of what we're gonna cover in this presentation. We are covering what a steam system does, how it heats a building and all that good stuff. And then for covering steam, uh, you know, what steam is, where it's used, why you'd use it over a forced air or a hydronic system. We're going to cover the steam and pressure relationship. going to go over some safety things. I think safety is uh, paramount, especially if you're working around this stuff. We've been around steam and it's kind of scary when steam is spitting out of a valve or it just is kind of nerve wracking. So we're going to cover safety stuff. And then we're going to go over the major components in a steam system. But uh, what you might see in a school or wherever you're working is a combination of maybe there's multiple boilers. There's probably going to be a lot of heat exchangers, but we're just going to cover everything from a base level and then understand that you can expand it out. The principles are the same. We're going to go over steam traps, talk about how important those are. And then uh, my favorite is water quality and why you should pay attention to it. So we're going to start off today with what is condensate. So condensate is water that's formed from condensed steam, and it's typically hot. So we're just going to get that out of the way so there's no confusion. 
Um, I know condensate can refer to lots of things, but in this case today, we're going to be using it with that definition. So here we're going to start with the typical steam system and we'll start on the left hand side with the boiler. And so this is where the heat is added to the system, to the water, and this will cause the water to boil. Depending on the pressure, the temperature will vary. So once that heat is given to the water, it will boil off into steam and it will go up into the main steam header. This is the red pipe going up out of the boiler. From there, it can flow to different components in the system. So for instance, a heat exchanger. A heat exchanger might be used to get domestic hot water heated or whatever else you're trying to heat in a system. And then once that heat is given off through that heat exchanger, the steam will condense into condensate and then it will go out through the steam trap. And we'll talk about that in a bit. The next component we have in the system is a radiator. So this would be used to heat a space, for instance, like on a wall. And again, once the heat is taken from the steam, it will condense and go out through the trap. And in certain applications, you need lower pressure steam or you could use the steam um, at a specific temperature. So for process, by changing the pressure, you can actually change the exact temperature of the steam. And that can be very useful in a process unit. So a process heating unit, again, can use the heat and condense and out through the steam trap. Another use would be an air handler. So heating a large building, you can, in the air handlers, run steam through coils and then run a fan over it. And once that loses heat, again, it goes out. And at the end of the line here, we have a drain trap. So this is to drain any water in the line. There's one in front of the pressure reducing valve as well. And that's just to prevent water hammer and water from building up in your line. So once the steam goes out through the steam trap, it will go back down into the condensate pump and tank to be typically reused unless for some reason it's contaminated. All right, thanks for that, Cole. Where is steam used? Uh, steam is used in a lot of uh, commercial and industrial applications on the right, that's gonna be an industrial application. It's used for heat energy and electrical power generation. So electrical power generation is gonna be passing steam through a turbine to create electricity. But what we're concerned, I mean, most of what we're covering has to do with heat energy, uh, space heating or process heat. So it's useful for humidification, for sterilizing medical supplies. At When I used to package medical devices, there was different ways to sterilize everything after it was uh, packaged. So one of those ways was steam. It's pretty common. And through those high temperatures that steam is capable of, you can kill the pathogens that are responsible for causing infection. So very important there, considering one of the uh, leading causes of death in the United States is uh, through infections at the hospital. So uh, after that, you have laundromats, get wrinkles out of your clothes, useful for food processing. If you're trying to make powdered milk or uh, in a refinery to make booze. And then lastly, it's very useful for pharmaceuticals. So People uh, say that Cydronics is becoming more and more popular and there's less and less people that are, I would say, capable or knowledgeable on steam. So people think that steam is dying, but that's not true. There's still places where it's very useful uh, and it has major advantages, which we'll go over. So what is steam and how does it move? The main place that most people see steam, unless you're in a boiler uh, room, is going to be in the kitchen, right? You have your boiling pot of water. And how steam is formed is you have your water. So the water is in three different states. It can exist. You have solid, which is going to be your ice, liquid water. Third is going to be the vapor. And the vapor is what we're trying to create when we make steam. So once enough heat energy is put into that pot of water, it begins to change phase. Right, you need enough energy put in to cause it to change phase, and that's what those bubbles represent. And uh, the steam it moves based off a of pressure differential. Okay, that's one of the main benefits 
versus hydronics or forced air. Forced air, you have a fan that's going to move your hot air. And hydronics, you have pumps. But for a steam system, you just need the steam itself to move um, as long as the pressure differential isn't too great. But usually you don't have to worry about that. It has a much higher heating capability than that of water because it gets to a much higher temperature. And steam and condensate in the United States are going to be measured in pounds per hour. And that's the mass flow rate that's passing through the pipes. So why would we use steam heating? Well, one of the reasons would be that it's clean and dust free. So you're not blowing air throughout your building. Um, this is especially relevant with COVID. Um, and then long service life, if equipment is treated properly, it can easily last in excess of 100 years. It can be a very cost effective method of heating, especially if you have steam as a byproduct from, say, an electricity plant or something like that. Um, and then rapid heating and easy to control temperature. So steam is much quicker to heat up than a hot water system as well as it's much easier to control the temperature as you can just change the pressure to change that. And then it's also a smaller footprint and pipes. The piping, steam can be compressed, water can't. So there's a big difference in the size of the pipe that you can run, especially at higher pressures. And then we're gonna discuss different types of steam. So- Hey Cole, can you hold on one second? Yeah. We got we got a no, a no sound. One moment. I saw, so that's David. I saw he was reconnecting. Can everyone confirm if they have sound right now? Just type yes in the chat. So it seems like we do have audio. Well, maybe. Maybe we can answer this question while David. Sure, I just I just uh, typed in if he could try to exit the webinar and log back in. So I think most of our guests are able to hear. So let's so, go. Um, John asked, are there steam applications in residential settings? And I'm gonna let Marcus talk about this. The answer to that question is yes. Not as commonly as once was uh, now in, out in the eastern part of the United States, steam is still used in in uh, residential settings, and boilers are still producing steam for heating systems, even in the Midwest. And it's all very low pressure steam, just maybe a half a pound to one pound, one to two pounds maybe. But it is it is something that's still used today, and uh, it's it's slowly being phased out because people just don't maintain those systems so so most of it nowadays is hot water systems hot water heating and boilers so yes there there is some of that still uh, available here in the united states probably in europe more than in there is here in the united states as a matter of fact thank you marcus and we actually have uh, one of our major account executives, one of our sales guys, he has, he has steam in his house and it's been there for 50 plus years. I'm just answering. Uh, David's having trouble getting in, so I'm just typing an answer. Okay. I saw he was having connection issues. Um, okay. Well, anyways, uh, this, this presentation is being recorded too, so... Uh, we can access it on YouTube. So I don't want to hold everyone else up. Hopefully, David can get back in. So uh, let's continue uh, for now. Okay. Uh, yeah, hopefully you can get back in. Um, so let's go over the types of steam quickly. Uh, so the first type is saturated steam. And what that means is the steam is at the boiling temperature of water for that pressure. So for instance, in open air, that's going to be 212 degrees. So steam and water will both exist at 212 degrees under the right conditions. So this means that there's a, it's a wet steam. Whenever that steam loses its heat, water droplets will begin to form in that steam. So water can accumulate. And if you're using like an uninsulated pipe, for instance, 
enough of that water to build up and create water hammer. Uh, flash steam. So flash steam happens when there's a pressure drop. Under pressure, condensate can exist at higher temperatures than, let's say, 212 degrees. So when you go from 10 PSI and you have water or condensate at 230 degrees, if you brought that to atmosphere, a portion of that water would flash off into steam because that heat has to go somewhere. Water can only, only exist at atmospheric pressure at 212 degrees. Superheated steam. So superheated steam is known as a dry steam. And this is because the steam is actually above the boiling point of water. So that steam had to be heated after it was converted into steam. This will not allow water droplets to form in that steam while it's above the boiling point of water. Um, and that's why it says it will not revert to liquid state. All right. So we do have some issues. There's a couple of people with audio. We're just going to, this presentation is recorded, so we can email the link to watch that later. So the steam pressure relationship for a pressure cooker, which is on the right here, we're increasing the pressure. So like Cole covered earlier, if at different conditions, you can have water. So if water is pressure, out, well, if you put pressure on the cooker, you it requires the steam to reach a higher temperature basically so more more heat energy has to be put in so the first table here you can see that as the gauge pressure increases the steam uh, pressure or the steam temperature also increases so that's kind of how your pressure cooker works you can cook food faster because you can cook it hotter and if we look at the sensible heat that's the amount of heat per pound uh, for sensible and latent the latent heat is far greater than the sensible heat sensible heat is the heat that causes the temperature to increase or decrease whereas latent heat is the amount of heat that is contained and that's when the phase change occurs going from water to vapor or vapor to water so you see that a lot of energy needs to be put into the water to cause it to jump from 212 where it's still liquid to jump into that steam or that vapor category uh, so just really important to remember that if you have if you're looking at a pressure gauge on your system and you know the pressure then you also know the temperature that the steam is is at for that so water boils at a higher uh, temperature if pressure is increased vice versa if you boil a pot of water on a mountaintop, like in Denver or in the mountains, and you're at less pressure, it's gonna boil faster and at a lower temperature. Uh, one of the benefits for steam is that you can pressurize it. So if we look at our bottom uh, chart there, we have, as you go from 10 to 100 PSI, the pipe size decreases drastically. So it's really beneficial if you look at a forest air system, you have big giant, like a foot, a uh, wide duct passing through a building it's hard for or makes it more difficult for building designers to have to work around that whereas if you can have smaller pipes uh it's very beneficial so in looking at the 10 inch and the four inch at different pressures you still have the same mass flow rate so i, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind so here we're going to start discussing components in the steam system and we'll start with the deaerator. So on the left here we can see there's a feed water inlet and this is where the condensate and makeup water will be injected and it will be sprayed out through a nozzle. And the goal here is to remove some of the air in that condensate and feed water. Air is very corrosive so getting rid of it will help your system run a lot longer and not have to replace as many parts so once it goes out through the spray nozzle it will get thrown in the left hand side which is labeled a this is the preheating section so your condensate will likely cool off a little bit below steam temperature and you need to get it back up to close to temperature of what the boiler is operating at so that you're not thermally shocking your boiler and 
there's a baffle here in between sections A and B, and this is to slow down the water moving from A to B. Uh, the bottom part, the steam sparger, this is actually where steam is coming from the boiler and being injected to heat up the water, one, and two, well, actually, because the water is being heated up, air is getting taken out. So that's the second part of that. And at the top, you can see there is vent, a vent in this case. Uh, sometimes deaerators can be vented to atmosphere, and sometimes they will be pressurized. It just depends on your application. Usually, if you're working on very high pressure steam, 30 psi and above, you're going to use a pressurized deaerator. However, if you're running below that, sometimes it doesn't make sense to run a pressurized deaerator. Um, and then on the left-hand side is just the steam inlet, which is where it's going to the sparger. And now we're going to talk about boilers. So boilers heat the water, either burning gas or oil typically. Sometimes you'll see electric or some sort of other fossil fuel. Uh, or coal. <laughs> there you go. Um, and then these are typically the main heat source of your system. Uh, sometimes you'll have reheaters or superheaters, but for the most part, this is going to be your main heat source. And then here are the two different types of boilers. Uh, well, two common types of boilers, I should say. Uh, we have the fire tube boilers. And essentially what that means is there is a giant drum of water and there are tubes with the hot gases going through them. And typically these are very efficient, straight, to, straight tube designed, and they tend to cost less than their counterparts. Uh, they are very easy to access and maintain relative as well as the water side is where a lot of scale and buildup occurs and they're quite easy to clean. The other type is a water tube boiler. So the advantages of a water tube boiler are you can have higher operating pressures, higher temperature outputs, they're capable of creating superheated steam, and they tend to last a little longer as well. And then here we're just going to go over heat exchangers and the general definition of what one is. Um, some common types that you'll see are shell and tube, uh, braised plate, or radiators. Um, and typically, anything where heat is transferred from one medium to another can be considered a heat exchanger. So because of they're trying to transfer heat, they're going to be made of conductive materials, so you don't have to have as much surface area. And those materials would that are common are either copper, iron, or steel. And then we are going to talk about recovering condensate and flash steam. Uh, so the reason you want to recover condensate and flash steam is efficiency. You can actually save between 9 and 35% of the overall efficiency of the boiler just by recovering these. Uh, because if you had to heat up, brand new feed water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit up to, let's say, 300 when you're operating under high pressures, that's going to take a lot of energy. And if you can, you want to reuse your condensate. It also keeps the system cleaner. You're not injecting a bunch of outside feed water that might have a bunch of minerals and other contaminants inside, meaning you also don't have to treat it with as many chemicals to prevent corrosion in your system. And when would you not reuse condensate? You would not reuse it if there's contaminants in it. So if you're working some sort of process and there's uh, some of that processed stuff leaking out into your condensate and you're aware of that, you're definitely not going to want to reuse that because it could build up and damage your system. And then here we have condensate pumps and tanks. So that's why we were discussing condensate. Um, so electric pumps, these are a very common uh, application, and it's actually the pump on the bottom right. However, they have temperature limitations as well as pressure limitations because of the seals on the pumps. So the solution when you have too high of temperature or pressure is you can use a pressure-powered pump. And these, as you can see on top, it's the diagram with the ball and float. 
they use compressed gas, typically steam or air, and they can also operate in a vacuum. And how they operate is condensate will flow in and there will be a check valve there so that it can't flow backwards. And once this tank begins to fill, which typically is vented to atmosphere so that it can fill up without creating back pressure, it will increase the level of the float. And once that float gets high enough, a valve on top opens, the breaker closes so that it's no longer vented, and then steam or air is injected, forcing all that condensate out. And you can use it to move it up like hill or just to get out of a vacuum. Okay, so steam traps. This is one of the one of the things that is fairly important, but probably gets neglected more than it should. Steam traps, as the name implies, is trapping the steam. These are just automated valves. There's all there's different styles, but just keep in mind it's an automated valve to prevent steam from passing through. It's trapping steam, and its job is to purge the system of condensate and non-condensable gases. And why do you want to get rid of condensate? Well, if you have too much condensate that builds up, you can get water hammer. And if you've ever been in a building and the boiler turns on, you start hearing clanking of pipes, there's a good chance that that is actually water hammer occurring. So steam typically travels around 70 miles an hour. And that's not an issue with steam passing. But as soon as a water slug gets caught up, and it's going at that 70 miles an hour, it runs into valves, elbows, T's, uh, steam traps, and other things, and it causes damage because the steam is at a lower mass than that of the water. So that's why you want steam traps, is to get rid of any process after like a heat exchanger that the steam is gonna give up its latent heat to the process and some of that steam is going to condense and to condensate and you got to purge that out so that's why steam traps are really important so they handle air carbon dioxide water and steam and they're really important for heat energy loss typically we go test customer systems and we found within a few years you can have up to 25 30 percent failure on steam traps so it's good to uh, constantly monitor them and there's different signs uh, of a failed steam trap, like if your boiler room is really hot, uh, th things like that. Uh, there's, there's more than that that goes into it, but that's just one of one of them. And the common types are the uh, float and thermostatic, the inverted bucket, and the thermostatic. So types of steam, uh, let's see here, steam trap materials. So the steam traps are, the bodies are mainly gonna be cast iron, and cast iron is really good material. It's, it's pretty cheap and it's chemically resistant, fairly durable, um, but it is brittle at high pressures. So if you have a high pressure application, you might have to switch to carbon steel. But keep in mind that the steam traps are usually going to have a cast iron body. And then some or most of the internals are probably going to be stainless steel to prevent corrosion over time. Now, if you're in a food great environment like a, a process plant for food then you're going to have to have stainless steel because you don't want any corrosion happening and passing in anyone's food but those traps are going to be very expensive so they're not nearly as common um, but yeah the, the stainless steel will be used for the internals almost all the time and then sometimes you can get all stainless steel traps and then for the carbon steel that's for really high pressure applications all right and then steam traps are going over f and t inverted bucket thermostatic and thermodynamic so the f and t trap uh, is this guy here uh, the pros of it are that it has a continuous discharge of condensate so as condensate enters this trap the ball will lift and condensate will flush out so inlet outlet is an equal rate for the condensate and since these traps can get really large sometimes like you know 150 200 pounds they're able to handle just due to the volume of the inside of the trap they're able to handle a lot of condensate but they're also good at handling a little condensate so they're beneficial for that they are resistant to water hammer 
uh, some sub or some some cons are that they're subject to freezing. But from talking with a lot of people, the F and T trap seems to be the ideal trap for most applications. So keep that in mind. And this is how it works. So the picture on the left here, we'll use the bottom one. The top one is how the older steam traps, F and T traps are designed. This is the bottom is the modern. So basically as condensate enters this trap, the ball lifts due to buoyancy. And once it lifts, the condensate flushes out the ball, the ball at the bottom that's touching off on the seat will lift off with the lever and condensate will flush out and then it'll go back down. So typically when these operate, it, depending on how much condensate you have, they might just kind of hover like this. Uh, it, it all depends on your process, how often the condensate is going to be flushing into the trap if it's constant or intermittent. And the orange is our air and steam. This is used for visualization. So the balanced pressure capsule is actually a thermostatic element. So that element right there is going to sense the steam or the air temperature. And if the temperature is high enough, if it's at steam temperature, that trap doesn't want to lose the steam. So that balanced pressure capsule is going to expand with the ball and it's going to touch off and prevent any steam from escaping. But as soon as that steam condenses and more water comes out and the temperature drops back down, that's going to lift off and allow carbon dioxide and air to, to exit the trap. So this is an automatic uh, air vent. And then John and John, we both see your questions and we will answer them near the end. Um, so for now, we're going to go over the inverted bucket. And some of the pros are that it can be used for high pressure applications. They're very durable and handle dirt well. We've seen that in the field. Um, a lot of the inverted buckets last a long time. We've seen some very old ones that have been operating. Um, and they're resistant to water hammer just because the bucket is very difficult to damage. And they can be used for superheated steam with the use of a check valve. Some of the cons are that it must have a water seal to operate. And what that means is the bucket needs to have some water in it on startup so that it doesn't just blow steam and air. And because of that water that needs to sit in there, that water seal, it is subject to freezing. If it gets cold enough outside, that water can freeze if there's no steam going through it. And another con is that it discharges air slowly, and we'll see that in the next uh, slide. So here we're going to talk about the operation of the bucket trap. So condensate fills the bucket, and we can see that on the right. That is the purple part. And then the steam is the red part. So once the condensate is in there right now, it drops the bucket down, and you can see the little lever on the left top that seals when the bucket goes up due to steam. And once it drops down like it is now, it's open and now the steam is causing it to close. So it operates in a cyclical fashion depending on what the bucket is seeing, if it's condensing steam or if it's live steam. And there's a bleed hole on the right-hand side, which you can see um, on the top right. Yep, Marshall's on it right there. And as you can see, when it goes up, some steam will leak through and it will go into that little chamber right there. Ideally, it would condense fully, but sometimes you will blow a little bit of steam through that. And that's why the air bleeding is so slow on this trap. It's a very small hole in that bucket and these traps can get air locked um, on occasion. And to fix that, you have to use isolation valves to kind of inject steam quickly. And you kind of have to toy around with them a little bit. Um, and then pretty much if you have any other questions about that, let us know. Otherwise, we're good for the thermostatic. Okay. Thermostatic traps, uh, thermo, just like in your house, it's a response to the steam temperature. So these just work off temperature, whereas the... The F and T and the inverted bucket are going to be mechanical traps that operate off buoyancy. 
So the two main types we're going to cover are the bimetallic traps, and that's just a trap that has a series of two different strips of metal. So as we know, different metals have different uh, thermal expansion properties. So they deflect different amounts at temperatures. And then for the last one we'll cover is the balanced pressure traps. And those are well suited to air venting. And this thermostatic trap uh, in the middle there, the, the golden one, that's something that you're gonna see off uh, a lot of radiators. It's, we see it all the time. So the bimetallic trap, it operates that, as I said earlier, the different metals are going to expand differently. And once they expand, think of like an accordion, once it gets up to temperature and you want to prevent the steam, once that certain temperature is hit, these metals are going to expand kind of like an accordion and it's going to close the ball off on the seat to prevent steam from escaping. So they are really good at air venting. Uh, they're really easy to replace the internals too. So it's like they're, you know, you just take the head cap off. You usually don't have to take them out of the line. Just take the head cap off and you can replace the internals fairly easy. They work for a large range of pressures and they don't freeze in outdoor conditions. Uh, one of the cons is that they are for fixed temperatures only and they don't have a pressure response. And as I went over previously, the inverted bucket and the F and T traps. There are large traps, whereas these traps are a lot smaller. So if you have a lot of condensate, these things can get flooded really easily. And we've we've seen that where you, you'll see condensate uh, dripping out of the, the radiator trap, radiator thermostatic. So that's uh, one problem with them. And then they can pass a lot of steam. So this balance pressure capsule down here this is what was oriented on the side on the inside of the f and t trap so this is what i went over earlier and it's kind of interesting if you take one of these and you shake it there's actually that orange right now if, if the time is the same as i'm presenting the liquid inside that capsule um, is made such that it has a lower boiling point than that of water so that as that water starts to heat up and it gets close to steam temperature the inside of that capsule is going to boil and that strip of metal is going to expand because it's boiling, the volume's increasing, and that ball is going to touch off on the valve and prevent any more steam from going out. So once, once that happens, once it expands, the, the condensate, it's going to condense and then it's going to open back up and allow condensate to pass through. So some cons that are really easy to maintain. Uh, the valve is fully open on startup and they automatically adjust for pressure changes, but they're susceptible to water hammer and water logging. Here we have the thermodynamic trap. So these are good for process applications and where you're seeing high temperatures and pressures. Uh, there's no pressure adjustment necessary. So if you have a trap that's rated for a high pressure, you can use it anywhere below that, you may run into um, sizing issues or load issues. Um, they have a large condensate capacity and they can also work with superheated steam. Uh, they are water hammer resistant, not susceptible to freezing as there's no condensate stored in them and they're quite easy to maintain. A con is that they're loud and sometimes they will leak a little bit of steam. And then here we have the thermodynamic operation. So the only part that moves in the TD traps are a disc. And the disc will move upwards when it's seeing condensate. And this will allow the condensate to flush out. So you'll see it going up through the middle valve, the middle orifice, and it will flow out the little orifice on the right. So how this trap closes is the orifice leading up to the disc is actually smaller than the steam line going in and what this does is it increases the velocity that that condensate and steam will see that and that lowers the pressure lowering the pressure will cause any condensate that's really hot to flash this will cause flash steam up near the disc and it will actually go up and around the disc 
and slam that disc shut. The reason it does this is there's a larger surface area on top. And until that steam condenses, the disc will stay down. So you cannot insulate a TD or a thermostatic trap. A F and T trap with the thermostatic element is also not recommended to be insulated because of that reason. Um, so that's how it operates. All right, water quality. This is could be a, a topic presentation on its own. I'm not an expert on this, but I wanted to touch on water quality and its importance. So water quality is important because if you have bad water quality, which a lot of people do, you're going to have higher costs, increased maintenance time, and premature failure of a lot of things. And we see it where someone might install something brand new and then two or three years later it fails and it's usually due to water quality. So what is water quality? For this presentation purposes, it is going to be your pH. That's how acidic or basic it is. And you typically, depending on your system, it's going to be different, especially if the system is at say a higher pressure, if it's low pressure versus high pressure steam, but between eight and 10.5, you're gonna to wanna to check with the boiler manufacturer, and then it's gonna be the total dissolved solids. And that's has a lot to do with the mineral content. So calcium and magnesium, and then the hardness of the water. So that's why you soften water. You don't want hard water, and that's gonna be due to the, the mineral content of it. Uh, next is the alkalinity. And the more alkaline the water is, the more carbonic acid is going to be present and the oxygen content. So that's why you have a deaerator or use chemicals is to purge the system of oxygen. So water quality breaking into two different things. You either have corrosion or you have scale buildup. That's a simplified version. There's more that goes into it, but that's kind of the basis. So hard water results in scale. And that is the left hand picture on the bottom. So scale is bad because you get more of that buildup. It's going to reduce your heat transfer efficiency. And inside the boiler, you can get boiler tube failure because the uh, tubes will actually overheat and can crack. And obviously you don't want to have to uh, open your boiler up and replace those things. And then if you're in a heat transfer device or a heat exchanger, you can get that scale build up. And as that scale builds up more, your heat transfer efficiency is going to tank. And then you're going to have to put more energy in to get the desired output. So alkaline water along with oxygen cause corrosion. So you have the carbonic acid, which is carbon dioxide that dissolves into water so this is going to be in the, the condensate area um, and then you also have oxygen so that's the top picture you're going to have uh, pitting so it just kind of attacks the pipes from the inside out and that's actually why it's recommended to use schedule 80 pipe in your condensate return line to plan for some of the piping being eaten away especially by the thread so that if you have to take something apart Hopefully you have some threads left and you don't have to repipe your system. So what can we do for water quality? There's lots of different things. First, you should be softening your water. And if you measure the hardness of the water uh, and it's outside the range of what you need, you need to soften it. Most people are going to have water softeners on their system. You want to reduce the scale buildup. Next, if you're if there's any boiler operators and attendants, you're blowing the boilers down daily and to get rid of dirt and sludge accumulation. Next is going to be a dealkalizer, and this is going to reduce the chance of carbonic acid in your condensate area, the condensate return line, and then getting your pH tested. So you want to make sure that pH is between 8 and 10.5, but check with uh, whoever designed that system or check with a water quality expert on that. And it's going to be uh, pertinent to the boiler that you have and how your system's operating. But the pH is going to drop over time. Once it drops, it becomes more acidic. Once it's more acidic, more corrosion takes place. So you can reduce the oxygen content using chemicals. 
So we have a little nice chemical bucket on the right there or using a de-aerator. And the de-aerator de is gonna purge the system of oxygen as well as heat up the water that goes in your boiler. Um, filtering out your solids. So we see a lot of strainers out there and make sure you're blowing your strainers down um, because once the strainer becomes clogged, screens get blocked, uh, it's gonna eventually pass some of that through to the steam traps and other things. So you have to blow down your strainers. It's not good enough that they're just sitting in your system. You need to actually blow them down let them do their job. And then using a magnetic filter. So there's a couple different companies, Takos one, Kalefi, I believe is how you pronounce it. And that just, it, uh, if you have that in line, a magnetic separator, it's taking all the ferrous material that's in the stream and pulling it out of your system. Um, and usually what I've seen people do is dumping a giant drum of some type of boiler uh, chemical treatment and to do all that, to reduce the oxygen, balance your pH and dealkalize de the system. And then if you really have some deep pockets, you can do reverse osmosis and that's gonna remove solids, alkalinity, oxygen and soften your water. But typically you're gonna end up dumping some chemical solution in and it's going to be a balancing act. You're going to want to make sure to check the water periodically to make sure it's within the range. And then here we're just going to touch up on rebates for steam traps. So Centerpoint Energy and another, oh, I think he skipped ahead. Another large energy company, um, XL, uh, they offer rebates for steam trap repairs and replacements. Uh, steam traps are rebate incentivized through local energy companies. So if you're not in the Twin Cities area, check with your local energy company. There's a good chance they'll have steam trap rebates. Um, qualifying trap rebates for Centerpoint, for instance, have rebates up to 35% of the trap's cost and can also possibly cover audits. Um, they cover F&T traps, inverted bucket traps, and thermostatic traps. They will not cover orifice traps. So that's what's available. And then we're just gonna discuss safety. Uh, so keep in mind leaks burn. Steam burns much faster than water because it can give off that latent heat very quickly. So you need to be careful when operating around steam systems, wear gloves, um, make sure that valves are closed, all that kind of thing. Um, and then low water cutoffs for boiler. So there's, probe and float style and you want to make sure to be testing these if you don't know how to test them look it up watch a youtube video and make sure you're testing these often usually on a monthly basis if not more often um, if your low water cut off fails you can put your boiler in a very dangerous situation um, safety relief valves and relief valves so safety relief valves are typically going to be set 5 to 10 PSI or 3% above max operating pressure. And what these will do is literally blow open once the pressure gets too high in your system. And the difference between a safety relief valve and a relief valve is a relief valve can open and close and relieve pressure whenever it goes above that. A safety relief valve will typically just blow off wide open and it will not automatically close. Um, so we also have water hammer. So when you're dealing with water hammer, especially on startup, uh, do not open valves too quickly. If there's a giant slug of water and you, it's all built up right in front of a valve. You open that thing and there's steam behind it. You're going to have a leak in a pipe downstream or worse. We've actually heard stories, um, of a radiator being blown off a wall at a school on startup. Um, because he, as the next point says, he high fired the boilers on a, from a cold start. And luckily there weren't any kids around at the school when it happened, but usually there are kids there. So you need to be careful. It can hurt people. Um, and it can easily burst a pipe and damage other components, causing steam leaks, reducing efficiency, all that good stuff. Um, and make sure to isolate steam traps or any steam component from the system before servicing. Uh, 
it's best to shut the system down, but we realize that's not always possible. So at least try to let the components cool and make sure you know the system before you just start opening valves. So here on the left, we have a picture of a boiler explosion. This was caused from a failure of a low water cutoff. And what happened was all the boiler or all the water inside the boiler had boiled off and the boiler began, began to overheat. So once feed water was actually injected into this, and what that will do is cause a ton of flash steam because the boiler is super hot. You're injecting water and it will just flash off, creating a massive pressure surge and it just blows up. Um, and on the right, we just have a funny little picture of a guy getting his butt blown up <laughs> from a uh, steam leak. Okay, so we're getting uh, a little late on our presentation. And I just want to let people know that we do have videos for repairing an F and T trap as well as an inverted bucket. Um, so I'm not going to go over those here just in the interest of time because I think we have some questions to answer. But for the F and T trap, it depends on the size and the make. But typically, what's really nice is if you have a failed F and T trap, you can just buy the faceplate, and the faceplate is going to have all the internals along with the new gasket, and you can just unscrew it. You can keep it in line, unscrew it, isolate it first, uh, take off the the body screws, and then replace it with the new one. Then you don't have to worry if there's any buildup inside the trap. Make sure you scrape that out, chip it out. Um, the trap is in really bad condition, like we've seen some that are 50 plus years and it's just corroded out. It might be worth just replacing the whole trap. Um, whenever you're replacing these, make sure that you clean thoroughly with sandpaper the surfaces where the gasket, uh, you know, where the surface is made up so that you have a proper seal and always replace the gasket if you open it up. So here's the steps for the inverted bucket. Again, we have a video that we've done on this on our YouTube channel. So if you just go state supply, uh, YouTube, and then you should be able to find that there. And this is just for the pressure change assembly. Cole goes through these steps. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, we're at the end. So we went over steam heating systems from a high level view, went over all the components some safety issues, water quality, and all that good stuff. So we hope you enjoyed it. We're gonna send a survey out to everyone attending. If you could please fill that out, be honest with us, we're trying to improve this. So let us know what you think. Um, and then we have, Cole, do you wanna announce the, the winners for the gift cards? If you're ready for that? Yes. Um, okay. We have George Kaya for the $50 and Gabe Monroe. For the hundred dollar congrats george and gabe um yes, if you could awesome. email me um right there at cangel at state supply.com we will get you those gift cards awesome yeah so there's our emails at the bottom there if you want to shoot us an email or you can just call in uh, if you guys have any questions we really appreciate it uh, these are some steam brands that that we offer and then also we're offering a free steam heating catalog. So this just has a ton of different products in there. And if you wanted to shoot us an email, let us know. We will get that sent out to you uh, free of charge. And now let's get with some questions. Okay. So first I'm going to give the first two to Marcus. And the first question is what pressures are considered a low pressure system and what pressures are considered a high pressure system? When we talk about steam and steam boilers, the low pressure is going to be zero to 15 PSI on, under ordinary circumstances. So, and anything above 15 PSI is considered medium pressure. And then once you get past 60 and go to about 65 PSI, then you're getting into a high pressure system. And I'll, uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Um was that the full response right okay i just want to keep it so quick here the second question do you have a recommendation for the best way to test steam traps and if they are working i know that cole and marshall have both done some steam trap testing and they use 
the uh, sound method, which is an ultrasonic testing machine. And basically all it is is you're listening for the cycles of the trap. So testing by sound is one of the most effective ways. And then secondly is the uh, temperature drop from the from the upside to the downside. In other words, from the in the inlet side to the outlet side, there's usually, this is a real basic uh, rule on, on, on steam traps is a 15, 15 degree temperature drop. That's, that's most of the time what you're going to see. So that's just a simple answer, but it's usually what, what it is. Okay. And then the third question, uh, as the system heats up, does all the lower temperature steam, so like zero to two PSI, and the network of pipes condense as pressure builds up, up to seven to nine PSI, at least in our system. So actually some of that steam that is between zero and two PSI, some of it will condense. And this is a little counterintuitive, but some of that steam will also heat up and flash will remain steam, I guess. So the latent heat will be given to sensible heat. So a lot of that condensate that will form will be heated up to the new boiling point, whatever that is, especially for small increases in PSI like that. So not all of it will condense, but some of it will. And then I'm gonna give this next one to Marcus again. Are there devices to automatically blow down boilers or is this a manual only way? On most boilers used in low pressure applications, there are really no automatic devices unless you have an automated system that has a program, a computer program that's set up to do that. And we don't really get into that very much. Uh, they're, they're out there, but they're not used all that often. The best way to do this is you've got three different types of boiler blowdowns. You've got a surface blowdown, you've got a middle blowdown, which is on the sight glass, and then you've got a, a lower blowdown, which is on the bottom. And those are the three that are manually operated. So you just open and close. And those are the basic ones. Now, if you wanted to get into an automatic or an automated type of a system, it's very intricate and it's very expensive, but it, they are out there. Awesome, thank you. And then also, Marcus, maybe you have some insight on this next one. So let's see. Josh said, thank you for the presentation. I just recently got my special engineer's license, and I was wondering if you guys had any recommendations for entry-level positions working with high-pressure boilers. Working with high-pressure boilers. Well, if you're working with a high-pressure boiler and you have your, your uh, engineer's, your special engineer's license, you're going to be working with someone that actually has a high pressure license. So make sure that you do that. And then you will, if your question is, is you wondering where you can do that? I mean, wherever there's a high pressure boiler in operation and someone has that high pressure license is where you want to go to. So that you might want to do a little research and find out where that would be. But they're they're definitely around, so so check that out and at, at different uh, process companies or the people that have uh, high pressure systems. So that would be the suggestion. Um, also, Marcus, what are your thoughts on water treatment for steam? Is it always needed? Yes, it is always needed, uh, as Cole emphasized. Actually, Marshall as well. Marshall extended he. he gave a very detailed explanation, which was really good. But yes, they are, it's, it's very important to have water treatment. You've always got to make sure your pH balance is within the, the boundaries that, um, that Marshall was talking about. So that's something that has to be taken care of. And also your, your, when, you when you talk about surface, the surface part of your boiler, you get a lot of times you get, uh, you get oxygen, that, that starts to build up on it. So they're, they're oxygen, let me put it this way, it's an oxygen eater, if you want to call it that. So it's a chemical that has to be taken care of. And as your boiler ages, then you get more of that oxygen that starts to form on the on the top of the boiler. So so yes, it is, it's very important to, to always have some type of water treatment. 
Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Noland is asking for the video. Um, we will be posting this to YouTube. It's actually being live streamed to YouTube right now, and it will be saved to our state supply account. So you'll be able to find it there. Um, and then James is asking, aren't you introducing air each time you blow down your boiler? And the answer to that is no. Uh, the boiler is at a higher pressure. So the air is at atmosphere and it's not going to air and steam. They flow from high pressure to low pressure. So the steam's going to be blowing out, but air won't be going back in. Um, so it says, Mike said, you mentioned avoiding high fire on startup. Does this refer to some kind of variable, variable burner? Um, Marcus, do you have any insight on this one? No, no, it does not refer to a variable burner. It just means that you're on startup, you're, you're slowly increasing the temperature of your boiler is what you're doing. So as you slowly increase the temperature of the boiler, you're increasing your, your pressure to whatever point you want to get it to but it has to be done at a very slow rate so that you're not you're not just uh thermally shocking the boiler and the water so i think mike probably has a burner that's either on or off it's i'm guessing what he meant here like that's what i would assume variable meant so how would you slowly increase the temperature i guess would you start at a lower pressure setting or yes, how? Yes, yes. Okay. You'd always start at a lower pressure setting. Very low, as, as low as you can go to begin with so that you can gradually increase it and introduce that that higher temperature to your to your whole system. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Marshall, can you go back to the slide with my email on it, please? I just, I just sent it to him, he got it. Oh, perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, Marshall, would you like to close? Yeah, I mean, I think that covers it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Really appreciate your time. We are going to be doing more webinars in the future. And off that survey, if there's certain topics you'd like us to cover, we can definitely do some webinars in the future. Uh, please check out our YouTube channel. Uh, give a like or, or shoot out a comment or something like that. It helps us out. Thank you very much. And... Looks like we got one more question, but if anyone wants to leave, feel free. Otherwise, you can stick around. Thank you. Oh, shoot. It wouldn't let me scroll down. Okay. It's Does state supply have a list of vendors or other that can come out on site to assess a steam boiler system? Um, if you're in the Minnesota near the cities, we could um otherwise uh marcus do you know of any vendors that um, we have that would go out yes there are there are several we can we can refer you to as cole said within the within our state and within the metropolitan area of minneapolis and st paul now uh you you would have to go to depending on where you're located if you're out of state then you'd have to probably go to maybe a boiler rep someone that that might be able to help you out with that otherwise james said he's in minneapolis so shoot sure. me an email and reach out to me and we might be able to come out there on site otherwise we can refer you to a vendor mm -hmm. um and then brent said bell and gossip pumps yes we do those yes. um we can help you however you need with bell and gossip pumps we can help you repair things we have videos on youtube um or if you have questions yep uh, there are several people here that can help you and answer your questions or identify parts repair parts we have an expert in-house as well yeah on our youtube channel we actually go over how to repair some major most common bell and gossip pumps so not sure if you're interested in that but please check that out and then for the anti-scale chemicals from john um you know you're going to soften the water to get rid of that hardness and then any anti-scale chemicals you use are probably going to address other things as well and keep everything in check so i would say no to that okay. but again you're going to want to check check the hardness periodically to make sure that um if it is becoming harder than you want it then you have to address mm -hmm. that thank you everyone Awesome. Have a great Wednesday.
and rest of your week. Uh, someone just okay. raised their hand. Is that intentional? I'm going to go with not. Kyle. <laughs> Get out of here, yeah. Kyle. All right, we're good. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Take care.